This is episode 76 of the 99 Forever podcast. I'm Eric Friesen, and my guest tonight is making her first appearance on the podcast. She's a former digital media content intern with the Edmonton Oilers, Brianne Sakowicz. Brianne, how are you doing tonight? I'm doing well. How are you? I'm doing really well. Yeah, it's uh, good to have you on the show. We're just one week away from the start of the 2023-2024 Oilers season. And after five long months, just how excited are you to have Oilers hockey almost back? Extremely. I've been to two preseason games so far, and I cannot wait for regular season to finally start. Yeah, I think I saw uh, you tweeted out some pictures of a game you went to. Uh, which one was that? Is it against the Canucks? I went to the first game of the season against Winnipeg, and then I went again against the Canucks. Oh, okay, yeah, I think that's the one I saw. And they're playing a preseason game against the Flames right now. We're recording this on Wednesday night, and the Oilers jumped out to a 2 nothing lead. Great to see the two Connors get on the board early. Yes, last time I checked, it is 3-2. Okay, perfect. Yeah, it was it was 2-2 the last time I looked, but uh, I'm just hoping that we'll be seeing that Connor connection uh, connect on a, a lot of goals this season. Oh, yes, I agree. That'll be nice. Absolutely. Um, And I mean, just when you look at the team going into the year, I mean, McDavid and Dreisaitl are both in their prime. They returned most of the same roster that won 50 games last season and gave Vegas their toughest test in the playoffs. So I just really feel like this is their year to finally win the cup. I seriously hope so. It's been so long since Edmonton's had a cup and like they're doing so well for the last two seasons that hopefully this year they're finally able to bring it home. Without a doubt. I mean, even the last four years, they've really been building. But you're right. In the last two years specifically, those are the years where they've just been on the brink of winning a championship. And you can see how close they are. And also, like you said, uh, it's been a long time, 33 years. It'll be 34 by the time the playoffs roll around. Uh, I was only 18 months old the last time they won the Cup in 1990. So uh, definitely due for another one. I wasn't even alive at that point. (laughs) Yeah, I, I'm lucky that I was uh, alive for uh, one Oilers Stanley Cup. Uh, missed out on the dynasty. Actually, I was born about five months after the Gretzky trade. So, oh. yeah, my well, my my mom was pregnant with me, obviously, at the time when it had happened in the summer of '88. So, uh, yeah, never wasn't around for uh, the Gretzky days at all. So. Uh, we'll we'll talk a little bit more about uh, Gretzky later on this show, though, as a, as a bit of a tease there. Um, and uh, first, I'd just like to find out a little bit about your own background as, as a fan of this team. So uh, when did you first get interested in hockey and how did you become an Oilers fan? Uh, so my parents took me and my sister to our first game back in February of 2006. And the atmosphere in the arena, like I was just hooked instantly, like. After we left the game, I used to do play-by-play commentary in our car as we drove to and from Edmonton because I lived in Cold Lake. And so it would just like, I just fell in love with like the atmosphere and the sport and it became an addiction, basically. That's awesome, yeah. Uh, And you know, play-by-play is tough to do. It's one of the, I mean, you and I both have a a broadcasting background. We know that that's, uh, as far as broadcasting jobs go, one of the, the toughest ones you can handle but yeah that's that's awesome I actually went to my first Oilers game back in 2006 as well uh, a little bit after you was April 1st uh, against the Flames Uh, and just did you uh, play any hockey growing up or uh, did you come from a hockey family or or was it just a a once in a you know year experience that your parents decided to just take you out to the game and see how you liked it Uh, so in 2006, Ralph Klein did Ralph Bucks, and my parents decided to use the money that Ralph Klein gave the um, Alberta residents to bring us to our first hockey game. Well, that's cool. So your parents weren't big Oilers fans. You sort of kind of gravitated towards it yourself? My dad's a Flames fan. Really? <laughs> He's from Saskatchewan, so he claims he gets to pick. <laughs> Well, I mean, I'm from Saskatchewan, too, but uh, where in Saskatchewan is he from? Good soil. Okay. See, I'm from Saskatoon, which is only a five-hour drive away from uh, Edmonton. So geographically, Edmonton is the closest NHL city to us. But you know what? 
in uh, in Saskatoon specifically, I can tell you that um, Edmonton and Calgary are two of the most popular teams. So has that uh, ever led to any uh, family disputes or uh, just kind of playful rivalries between the two of you, especially, I guess, last year in the playoffs? Mostly playful rivalries. Um, we do let him have like Flames gear, but we also <laughs> make him have Oilers gear. Oh, okay, so. so you're slowly trying to convert him. Trying, being the keyword. <laughs> and what's the what's the bragging right situation been like uh, since you uh, since the Oilers uh, won the first uh, playoff battle of Alberta in over three decades back in 2022? Uh, we just don't talk about it because I want him <laughs> to <remind> my dad. <laughs> Fair enough. So your family isn't all in Edmonton then. Now they're still in Cold Lake. Yeah, yeah oh, okay. I live with my sister in Edmonton, and my parents are still in Cold Lake. Gotcha. And uh, who were some of your favorite Oilers players when you were a kid, and why? Andrew Cogliano. I okay. still love him to this day. Yeah, you know he uh, he had a a really good rookie season with the Oilers in oh seven oh eight. Uh, I think that for him. It was kind of adjusting his role because he he didn't maybe develop into the offensive type player that the Oilers expected him to be when they picked him in the first round back in 05. But he, you know, has carved out a really solid career for himself as a, a third line kind of checker that can chip in a little bit here with Anaheim and then later on with uh, Colorado. It The only thing that kind of hurts is that I remember in the 2017 playoffs, he scored an important goal against the Oilers with the Ducks, and then he scored against the Oilers again in the 2022 playoffs with the Avalanche. So, yeah, it's one of those players I wish they would have hung on to. I Every trade deadline, my only wish is that they re-sign him. <laughs> Maybe bring back Gagne to have a, have a little Sam Gagne, uh, Andrew Cogliano reunion. It's a reunion, yes. Yeah. I fully support that. I don't know if they're going to bring back Robert Nielsen, though, to complete the kid line. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I highly doubt that, but I see, yeah, it's just like his, like, he had such an amazing Ironman streak going, too, for such a long yeah. time, and then he got that suspension. Yeah, it's a tough break that that's how it came to an end. I think, I, I remember watching the interview um, that he did after that, and he was getting emotional about having that streak come to an end. He was doing, like, and it was, the suspension just wasn't worth what happened. Yeah. It was just, like heartbreaking but even then we went i did attend both colorado games in 2020 wow in the in the western conference final yeah so i was actually given tickets to the first like game three and then i won tickets from the oilers <laughs> oh no four. way yeah That's so i awesome. did the both games and my mom told me i could not wear my cogliano jersey to the <laughs> ring but that didn't stop me from taking a lot of photos of him Oh, for sure. <laughs> and, you know, um, I mean, it, it's good that you won them because I, I went to my first playoff game that spring as well. It was game one, the very first game of the playoffs against the Kings. And I know what the prices were even like for first round tickets. So I can only imagine what the conference final would have been like if you didn't win those. <laughs> we were two rows above Colorado's bench from the tickets given from the Oilers. Oh, OK. Yeah, it was insane. Like when I got the tickets, I was like, is this real life? <laughs> Yeah, it's a. It's too bad they couldn't have won at least one of those uh, games on home ice. It looked like they were going to win Game Four. They, they had a lead, and then they did. Ob yeah. Obviously, it went to overtime. And I guess if you were at uh, above the Avalanche bench, you would have been at the end of the ice when where the Avalanche scored the the winner. I think so. Yeah, it was a it was a tough tough sweep. But uh, you know, looking ahead two years. Uh, the the value the valuable experiences that they had during that playoff run I think will really pay dividends going into this year and uh, I just think not only is the roster even upgraded from that point but they've learned a lot along the way and it just seems like they're they don't have that unbeatable team in front of them this year that the Avalanche were in the 2022 playoffs. That's true, but hopefully like this year we'll be able to finally get that cup yeah hopefully the oilers are the the unbeatable team in the playoffs this year <laughs> yeah. uh and uh so we we kind of just briefly uh talked about it already but um do you remember any other details about your first oilers game you mentioned it was in 2006 uh, uh who was it against do you remember if anyone scored was, was there any other things that really stood out to you uh we played minnesota we lost six to three mm. uh yeah so <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah, they have a tough track record against the the Wild. It seems like they've had the Oilers number for years. Yeah, so, I mean, I can't really remember who scored at that point, but, the, like, it was a pretty solid game. But at the same time, we still lost. But yeah. just, like, being able to, like, experience my first in-person hockey game was just a memory I will never forget. Yeah, I mean, I, I sort of echo that. Just driving over that hill, you know, right when you're coming down Wayne Gretzky Drive and you see the arena for the first time. It was a, it was a pretty awesome experience for myself as a, I mean, I was even 17 the first time I went. You would have been a little younger than that, I guess. Uh, but very cool to get to, you know, be in an NHL building, especially one as historic as Northlands Coliseum. It's literally my favorite building in the entire city of Edmonton. Yeah, it's too bad they couldn't have repurposed it. I was thinking that, you know, once the Oilers were done playing there, they might, uh, I heard reports that they might be turning it into like a, a minor hockey arena where there would be multiple sheets of ice or something like that. I seriously wish they would have done something because the rumor is going around that they're tearing it down. I fully intend on taking that day off of work, <laughs> going and standing in the Expo parking lot. I'm just going to ball my eyes out. <laughs> Yeah, it's a, it's it'll be a tough one for for Oilers fans. I mean, it's stood for basically 50 years now, and the Oilers played there for over 40. So, uh, countless memories made from uh, hockey fans. And you know, whenever I have people on the the show, I always ask them about what they remember about their first game at that building. And uh, there's only been a, I think a couple people whose first game wasn't actually at Northlands; it was at the the new building, but. Yeah. Um, so many, you know, great memories from when you hear, I've had, uh, guests on the show who experienced their first game in the seventies, the eighties, the nineties, all the way up until, uh, I guess closer to when you and I would have went to our first game. So it's just, it's really cool to hear all the stories that people have from throughout the decades. Yeah. I like, just like the building altogether. Like I actually ended up buying Rogers play seats or Rexall play seats. I oh yeah. Had. They put yes. them on sale. I remember seeing that there was a. Another guy I follow on Twitter who uh, bought two seats as well. Yeah, I made sure I bought three, the 300 seats because those were the only original seats in the arena. And oh, nice. Clean them, and they are in my basement. And I was gonna say, are, are they prominent? I was gonna say, are they prominently displayed in your home? Yes, as much <laughs> as Mister would not like them to be. Yes, yes, they are. <laughs> I mean, you, you got to decorate with some classic uh, Northland seats, right? Absolutely. <laughs> And uh, what is your favorite memory of watching the Oilers uh, either on TV or live at the arena? Um, so I have games that like are like a must go to for me. And one of my must goes was Ryan Smith's returning game as an Oiler. Back in 2011. Yeah. And like just like being in the arena and having him like scale onto the ice and like just how loud the crowd was and like how emotional everything was to see Ryan Smith back in an Oilers jersey he was phenomenal yeah I mean he was uh one of my biggest heroes growing up uh I remember I took the day off of school in uh or at least the morning off of school in 2007 during the trade deadline I was in grade 12 at the time and I just wanted to see if the trade was going to happen it had got to lunch hour the trade <laughs> nothing had happened so I was like okay I'm going to go to school it's it's basically over uh, my dad picked me up after school, and then he told me on the the car ride home that uh, that Smith had been traded to the Islanders, and it was just like such a deflating feeling because the Oilers had been to the Cup final the year before, and earlier in the decade the Oilers had lost so many of their top players year after year: Bill Guerin, Doug Waite, Curtis Joseph, just all out the door because they couldn't afford to keep them. And even though it was a bit of a different situation because the Oilers were uh, I guess uh, it was a contract negotiation that went wrong. It, they they could have afforded to keep him. It was just a it was a shame to see him leave. And uh, he should have been a, a Oiler beginning to end. And uh, I know he was gone for four years, and I'm glad he came back and finished there. But uh, if there was one player who should have spent their entire career in Edmonton, it, it should have been Ryan Smith. One hundred percent. Like just like his dedication to the team you could it was just there and you could see it and when he came back you could see his dedication until his retirement oh without a doubt and i i also remember when i heard the news back in 2011 it was right around the nhl draft that uh smith had requested uh, a trade back to edmonton so that he could be closer to home and 
I, I mean, this is something that I never thought I would see. And, and here he was coming back and leaving a, a Kings team that would obviously uh, go on to win the Stanley Cup the following year, but that he was such a loyal oiler that he wanted to have a chance to uh, come back to where his career started and finish there. So I really respect that. Right, because you see players play their career somewhere else and then get signed the one-day deal to retire yeah. as that person. But to come has Ryan Swift to come back and play seasons again with the Oilers because that's where he wanted to be it was just you could see the passion for the Oilers while he played Mm -hmm. and actually back in 2018 when I was an intern reporter at Newcap News in Lloyd Minster I had an opportunity to uh, interview Ryan Smith and when when the station manager called me into her office and told me about it I couldn't believe it that I was going to get this opportunity to drive out to this town where there was an AJHL game being played at a neutral site and and Smith was going to be there for the opening ceremony. And when she asked me if I wanted to be the one to interview him, because she knew I was a hockey fan and, and a big Oilers fan as well. uh, I mean, I jumped at the chance and there was a snowstorm that day, so I almost didn't get to do it, but just getting the chance to not only meet one of my heroes, but interview him uh, definitely the best day of my broadcasting career, and uh, I've said this before, but uh, a top 10, top 5 day of my life. Well, absolutely. I worked Ryan Smith's retirement day. Oh, uh, back in 2014. So, yeah, so... That was like, a, that a, a emotional. Everything. Yeah, it was. I, when, you know, uh, there's so many things from that night that I'll remember, like obviously waving to the crowd. It was very Gretzky-esque to... Wayne's uh, retirement at Madison Square Garden in 1999, but uh, just seeing Ryan and his five-year-old son Alex walk out from the dressing room to the ice together, uh, definitely one of the the coolest moments of that night. It was probably one of like my only games that I, because I always watched uh, warm up and everything from the catwalk, but that one game, I was standing on the stairs at the media center to watch him walk onto the ice. I think I actually filmed it. Oh, really? I feel like yeah. I, I feel like I have a film of him walking from the Oilers doors onto the ice with his son. Oh, that's cool. And I mean, getting to see him wear the the C for the Oilers for the first and only time in his NHL career, to have his son out there with him for the warm up, just uh, it, it. If he couldn't end his career by winning a Stanley Cup, I I can't think of a more perfect way for him to call it a career than how that night turned out. Right, and he needed that one more power play goal. I know. Do you remember the five-minute shift? Oh, my gosh, it was insane. Like We just kept watching him skate back and forth to the bench. They're like, no, no, you're staying out. Well, he had tied the record in a game against the Islanders, I think, the previous week. Uh, Glenn Anderson's all-time uh, power play goals record with the Oilers, which Leon Dreisaitl is on pace to break uh, very soon. Uh, he might even do it in the, the season opener, being only two goals away now. But that would have been awesome for him to even write more of a, a storybook ending to just have uh, that record as well. But still, yeah, lots of lots of great memories uh, from that final game in 2014. It was a tough year for the Oilers. That That whole era was obviously very tough. But there were some really nice moments sprinkled in there, like uh, as we talked about the Smith's retirement as well as the Sam Gagne eight-point game back in 2012. So even though it was a, a very difficult time to be an Oilers fan in terms of on-ice results, they they at least gave us a, a few uh, shining moments like that to remember. It was very true. Like, even, I mean, I didn't work Sam Gagne's. I wasn't there yet. But, like, just to, like, see, like, those random spurts that they had, they're like, okay, so, yes, we are a team that, like, can actually do something during those really, really dark rebuilding er- yeah. eras was great. But you know what? At the end of the day, I would go through all of it all over again if I knew that Connor McDavid was waiting at the end. That was the that was the prize for putting up with a decade of losing hockey and and a lot of that decade right at the bottom of the league. But uh, when you get a player of uh, his ilk out of it, it was uh, it was definitely worth it. What was it like? Eighteen point three, eighteen point six percent, or something like that. I think it was even less. I, I believe it was eleven point five percent chance. So not not great odds, but I mean, they still had the third highest odds of anyone uh, in that draft lottery. So uh, 
thank God it worked out in our favor. <laughs> and uh, the, the past eight years have, have been tremendous watching him. And let's hope that a uh, year nine ends with a celebration on the ice. Fingers crossed, definitely. <laughs> and uh, how many Oilers games do you typically attend each season at Rogers Place? And when you first saw the new building, did you ever wish that the Oilers were playing there when you were an intern? Um, I go to a couple games every season. It all depends on like the must do games that I like. I see because I'm my alumni player is Kevin Lowe. Okay. Um, and so with his retirement night was like I could not miss it. I have like I actually have a 1980s Kevin Lowe jersey. And so, like, just being able to wear that, like, on his retirement night. And so that was, like, it's definite, like, must-go game. This year, I so far have been to two preseason, and then I'll probably attend at least two regular season. Nice. Yeah, I went to the game two nights before that, uh, the the night when Kevin Lowe's uh, jersey retirement was in uh, November of 2021. And, you know, they beat the Preds 5-2, to so it was a, you know, a good night at Rogers Place. And... Uh, I almost wish now that I had went to the next one and it didn't look that I like, (laughs) I was going to say that the night didn't start off that, uh, that great. The Oilers were down four to one at one point, came back to tie it four four. the Rangers scored again to make it five, four. And then McDavid scores what I, what I believe to be the greatest goal of his NHL career. Uh, I know that there's a, a lot of people who still think the Columbus one is, I have that one at number two. But uh, just (laughs) to deke through four guys and then the goalie, unbelievable. I mean, I can't even do it justice describing it. But the thing is, is that anyone listening to this podcast is a hardcore Oilers fan. So (laughs) they've all seen it um, probably countless times. And uh, it'll be a tough one to top. But knowing McDavid, he (laughs) he probably he's going to try. Yeah, for sure. And but yeah, that would have been a great game to go to as well. And. I did go to the the game uh, the the Oilers Hall of Fame game last year when they retired Ryan Smith and Lee Fogelin, um, but uh, or I, I shouldn't say retired them they they honored them. Uh, yeah, be getting enshrined as the inaugural class of the Oilers Hall of Fame. So uh, very cool that Charlie Huddy and Doug Wade are also going to get that opportunity this year. And uh, you know when you and I first uh, interacted on Twitter about a month ago, we we also talked about the Heritage Classic. I'll be there for it, and I remember you said it was a bucket list item for you. Uh, were you able to find tickets fairly easily? And uh, as a hardcore Oilers fan, uh, how cool do you think it will be to watch them play outdoors in front of nearly sixty thousand fans? Um, I found tickets really easily because I kind of got a season seat holder to buy me tickets when they got theirs. <laughs> That'll help. <laughs> <laughs> so when tickets went out to uh, someone we know that is a season seat holder, I had asked her two months in advance if she could buy extra t- seats for me and my sister so we could go. And it turns out she's not even able to go. So she just used her ability to buy tickets early <laughs> to buy me tickets. And then I paid her back. So, so you're going alone? I'm going with my sister. So, oh, okay. <laughs> which I claim is her birthday gift, which she does not appreciate. <laughs> Wait, is she an Oilers fan too? Yes. Okay, well, I mean that should still kind of count, right? <laughs> I so, mean, if someone if someone would have got me a Heritage Classic ticket for my birthday, I would have been thrilled with that. So, right? That's why I mean that's why I thought I bought them for myself as a present for paying my taxes last year. Okay. So, <laughs> for me, that's... it was like this is a definite game we're going to because when's the next time the Heritage Classic's actually going to be in Edmonton? Yeah, I mean it's been twenty years. You would think that the Oilers would play in these type of games more often. Uh, I remember there was. Probably it feels like almost a decade long stretch where the Chicago Blackhawks were in one every year. Now I realize Chicago is a major U.S. city, and they had won Stanley Cups in that era, and they did have superstars like Jonathan T- uh, Taves and Patrick Kane. But at the same time, yes, Edmonton might not be on the same uh, level in terms of city recognition that Chicago is but when you have a superstar the likes of Connor McDavid you should want to show him off as much as you can so I would think that the Oilers should be playing in one of these outdoor games if not every year every other year this is only the second one that Connor will have played in I went to the first one back in 2016 in Winnipeg and they did a fantastic job hosting that Uh, I couldn't miss that one that was uh, an incredible experience the alumni game was almost 
as big, if not a bigger draw for me than the actual regular season game, just because I was going to have the opportunity to see Wayne Gretzky and the rest of the 80s legends play live for possibly the last time. Uh, it's too bad they didn't decide to have an alumni game this year. I think that really would have been a cool thing to do with a lot of the um, 80s players uh, for both teams, but also some of them are getting older. So I think we would see more of the 2000s contingent of players, uh, the Jerome Ginla led Flames and the Ryan Smith led Oilers. Those would have been the teams that you probably would have preferred to to see because they're a bit younger. And, you know, for a, our generation of Oilers fans, it would bring back a lot of memories. So missed opportunity there, I think, a little bit. But the, the event should still be really cool overall. Oh, yeah. I can't wait. Like to because it's like over 60,000 fans are going to be yeah. in the stadium. Like I mean, to, like, the atmosphere at Rogers Place during like any game is insane. Add uh, another like 40,000 fans. Exactly. And, you know, when I went to the one in Winnipeg, I remember people saying to me, oh, you're going to be so far away. They're going to look like ants. You won't even be able to see them. I'll tell you, I was on the upper deck uh, at IG Field in Winnipeg and I could still see the ice great and I could follow the play. So I don't anticipate that being an issue at all at Commonwealth Stadium. So for anyone who thinks that it might uh, be not the best view, like, yes, it will be at night. So that could change things a little bit. But I just think that being up top is still going to be a better perspective than down low, just because when you're almost on the level of where the field is, there isn't enough of a slant on the lower bowl to really give you a good vantage point. So uh, do uh, where are you actually uh, seated for the the game? Halfway up the lower bowl. Okay. (laughs) We're on the red line. Oh, well then you should still be fine. Yeah. We're on the red line of the, I, I looked at it and I, I thought about getting, you know, down there. But once I saw the, the different views it, it showed on the website, I was like, I'm going to be up top. It's a little bit cheaper, too. And I, I think that it'll just be able to look down on the field a little more. So I'm still hoping that your seats will be looking great. I don't want to discourage you by any <laughs> means. There oh, you, I'll still be there. It's fine. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, that's the biggest thing I have. My parents are going to be watching on TV. My dad's uh, you know, an Oilers fan, too. And I, I said to him, you'll have a better view than I will watching on TV. But I just want to be able to say I was there. Exactly. It's like being able to say that you were in attendance to this game. Yeah. I, I wanted to go that. to the original back in 2003 when I was 14. Um, that was a, a game that I'd asked to go for. But just you know with the ticket prices that they were plus having to like drive from Saskatoon to Edmonton book hotel my parents didn't decide to go through with it but still getting to watch it on tv was an awesome experience and uh that was sort of the first time that all the legends from the 80s were back on the ice together and the first time like I said I was I was born five months after the Gretzky trade so it was the first time that Gretzky had ever played a game in an Oilers uniform in my lifetime. And I'm roughly the same age as Gretzky's kids, so it was the first time for all of them as well. Uh, And I think he said that was a big part of the reason he decided to play in the alumni game, because he normally doesn't play in quote unquote old timers games but it was uh he wanted his kids to be able to see him play in an Oilers uniform and uh it would have been cool if uh he could have done it one more time this year if there was one but I have a feeling he will still be at the event as an ambassador I'm hoping the alumni players are there like I assume Mac T will be there Kevin Lowe like the ones who still yeah. kind of are around Edmonton but I do hope Wayne Gretzky is there I'm sure a lot of the legends are, are going to fly in for it even if it's just to be in sort of an opening ceremony at the start to drop the puck or or something like that. But um, yeah, it should be a great time. And uh, let's move on now to talk about your time interning with the Oilers. And you had mentioned to me before that you started there during the lockout shortened season in 2013 and were there for the full 2013-14 season. Uh, That must have been an incredible experience for you. Just uh, had you been thinking about applying to join the digital media team for a while? And uh, what were the emotions like when you found out that you got the internship? So I actually got the job in a very odd way. Um, when So I attended Nate for my broadcasting degree. And to get into Nate, you had to fill out a career uh, investigation report. So you had to find two people who were in the broadcasting field and interview them. 
and get like an idea about what being in broadcasting is. And I actually used Tom Gonzola as one of my people. Oh, nice. And during that time, I think at some point I had mentioned that, oh, my dream job is to work for the Oilers. Well, I moved to Edmonton to go to school. And the lockout happens. And I'm like, great, this sucks. <laughs> so I finished my first semester. It was what it was. I go into just about starting my second semester. And I get a message from Tom saying, so due to the lockout, we never hired our interns for the season. So it was me and then two other um, people from my class who were offered the internship for the shortened season. So we split the games three ways and then we just kind of went in and we got to watch what was going on. We got to do a little bit of editing. I ended up having to go in and actually do an interviews with the Chicago Blackhawks at the end of the 2013 season. So one of their last games of the season. Because and they won the cup the, that year too. Yeah. Um, Cause the, I think it was Tom was gone that day or something. So I ended up being able to, like, it was weird walking in to have the Oilers mic in your hand. And I think I was seen like in a couple of other of the cameras. And I was like, this is really cool. And then the following season, one of the people who I was working with had left from my program and decided not to continue with the Oilers. So then the first half of the 2013, 2014 season, we, me and this other girl split games 50, 50. And then we, we're fully in practicum for January of 2014 and we work every game into the end of the season but honestly getting like the texts from Tom telling me that hey I have an internship are you interested in it was like are you serious like this is this is my dream <laughs> job so I was like I, I called my mom and I was like mom you'll never guess who just messaged me and what they asked me to do <laughs> that's awesome you know, uh, I was in broadcasting school right around the same time as you. I finished in um, April of, two, of 2013. So, and I went, I went to Mount Royal University in Calgary. So I was uh, in enemy territory to get my, How my dare broadcast you. into. A, I know, you know, <laughs> and you know, may, maybe if I I had some family in Calgary, so it it made it a, a little easier to get my bearings there. But uh, maybe I would have. Uh, looked at Nate otherwise I I had been given some uh you know advice from a, a local broadcaster at CTV here in Saskatoon as well to uh, look into MRU so that was sort of my my biggest draw to end up going there but also maybe if I was in Edmonton going to Nate I would have been too distracted by the Oilers so maybe it was good <laughs> that I was a, a little further away and there was actually one other Oiler fan in my class from Edmonton so that uh, well, I, I wasn't sure. I wasn't alone on an island, at least <laughs> there. <laughs> I was surrounded by Flames fans, though. And then I, I did it to myself again, going to grad school in Toronto, being amongst Leaf fans. So, uh, you know, clearly I, I like to have my back against the wall, be yeah. surrounded by uh, <laughs> these other fan bases that hate the Oilers. <laughs> yeah, I, I would not be able to handle that. I looked at Satan, I was like, mm, no. And, you know, interestingly enough, um, back in 2012, uh, my one of my instructors in the the TV portion of of the program uh, had received a message from uh, Kevin Lowe and the Oilers organization and Daryl Cates that they wanted a small documentary put together on a player that they were interested in signing. And uh, he lived in a small town and he was sort of going to fill like a bit of a an enforcer type role he was going to be out there to protect uh nuge and hall and eberly so a friend of mine from the program i asked to come out there and we we went out there shot it met him uh came back to uh, watch a couple of his games in okotoks and film those as well and uh, he didn't end up actually signing with the oilers but it was pretty cool that i got to work on a project um that was sort of assigned by uh, the Oilers general manager and president of hockey operations. And uh, it's still something that I have on my demo reel to this day. Of course I like, so I used to do features when I was with them and they actually used my game day live feature that I had made for two seasons after I had left. Oh, nice. So it's like go to games and be like, I, I made that. <laughs> you could always point it out on the jumbotron to whoever yeah. you were with there. <laughs> yeah. I was like, Hey, look, I made that. It might be a nice. little bit old, but I still make that. <laughs> uh, and um, so just let's let's go back to your time working with the team. Take me through a typical day 
of uh, being a part of the Oilers digital media team. Uh, did you work exclusively with Oilers TV or did your tasks sort of change day to day? So I was employed fully by Oilers TV. I did a little bit of Oil Kings work, depending on what was going on with the Oilers. Um, but exclusively with Oilers TV. Um, I'll go through a game day. Um, my coach at that time was Dallas Aiken. Yeah. So he loved his 8 a.m. practices. Oh, and so you were always out there at that time. We had to be at the rink by like 7.15, 7 7.30. Well, that's always fun. Yeah. So very early mornings. So uh, me and this other girl got to pick kind of what we wanted to specialize in. And so I kind of want to specialize in like the features. So I ended up getting to edit and shoot practices. So I would, whenever the Oilers hit the ice, I would be on the visitor bench shooting the Oilers practice, texting Tom, finding out who he was going to be looking forward to that day and who he was planning on interviewing later. Um, so I'd get that footage and then I'd do a little bit of editing it for it because I never really went into the Oilers dressing room. I did have quite a few coaches rooms and then I would film the opposing teams practices and then I would follow Jack Michaels into the opposing team's dressing room and do his one-on-ones that he did pregame and yeah, then because he after, started with the team around 2010 so he would have already been there yeah. for a few years at that point yeah so yeah so he did other sides where he like he just picked one player on the opposing team and that's the only person we talked to before the game and then I would go back edit the feature together and then depending on what time the game was we'd either have a little bit of time where we could like go change uh spend a little bit of time not at the rink and then we'd generally meet around the rink between four to six depending on game time and then have dinner and go grab our stuff and then head up to the catwalk so we'd be there ready to go for the pregame and then we'd watch the game and part of my job was to edit goals whenever the Oilers scored which (laughs) during that era happens sometimes so how Um, many how many total hours on a game day would you actually spend at the arena uh so if I did a full day I would started about 7 15 7 30 and if it was an 8 p.m game i would leave the rink around 2 a.m the next morning yeah and then i'd i did this also while i was still a nate student (laughs) going to class so then i'd have to wake up the next morning and go to class and then do it all over again so you were there for almost 20 hours Uh uh-huh yep wow yeah some days yes that's, other days, that's like, the dedication. A little bit better. Yeah. It was like, like at some points it was exhausting, but other times, like if it was a 2 a.m. start or end and I got home at that point, then, and we were leave out of town the next game because I never went on any road trips. Okay. Um, I could probably head into the office for about 10 instead of like the usual, like 9, 8 30, 9 o'clock. Yeah. I mean, I, I know it sounds like a, a job that you, you know, enjoy doing, but, uh, Probably, probably those uh, 7 a.m. or uh, 7:15 starts because of Dallas Aikens' early practice times would get, a, or even just morning skates would get a a little uh, annoying by the time that you realized it was going to be a late start. And plus, you had a lot of work to do post game as well. Yeah, because I always did opposing dressing um, dressing rooms with uh, Chris Scott. So. Oh yeah, he would have been there at the time yeah. too. Yeah. Uh, he he actually started with the Oklahoma City Barons, mm-hmm. right, and yeah. then came up. He came up in the 2013-2014 season, yeah. And he was the head writer for EdmontonOilers.com at one time, right? He sure was. That's awesome. Uh, And then uh, which players from your time with the team were the most fun to work with? And can you share a story or two about one of them off the ice? Uh, So I have a couple favorite players. Luke Gadstick was fantastic. Um, He was always like somehow in like a very good mood even if like we weren't doing girl who's always in good mood um i would always edit my features and on the stairs to the media center because the oilers tv actual room was the size of a closet <laughs> it fit two desks and a futon and then our luggage and that's all it fit. so i would sit on the staircase and edit my videos and so there was one practice i was just sitting there and i could hear the locker room music playing and he came out full-on singing war by Katy perry <laughs> It was great. It was great. I loved it. Those are the behind the scenes stories that you'd never hear or or even think that someone would do, but that's awesome. It was great. Um, no, Yakov was 
honestly one of the players I was closest to while I was on the team. He was super, super sweet. Obviously didn't know a lot of English at the time, but right. still like tried to make his way, like to make sure he was still like treating media staff and everything with respect and everything. So he was really awesome. Um, not player, but coaches, Buck Berger and Smith <laughs> really enjoyed snowing me. Really? Yeah, like, yes. <gasps> yeah. Yeah. There's a few times I would literally just be filming Oilers practice and they just come up and snow me. And I'm like, <laughs> Thanks, but that, that kind of shows that you're part of the team, right? Like, yeah. I, I think that's that's almost like them welcoming you into the group. It might actually be worse if they didn't joke around with you like that. <laughs> right. I mean, it took a while, but like ha- about halfway through my like full internship rows at the rink every day. Yeah. They started like just messing with me. And I was like, I mean, it would be true <laughs> if you didn't. then obviously, like you didn't accept me as one of you guys. <laughs> exactly. That That's a that's a funny story about uh Gazdick and Yakupov too and uh I mean you would have been there for Gazdick's first NHL goal on his first shift back in we just it would pass the 10th anniversary of it the other day it would have been October 1st 2013 so pretty cool to see that guy uh get claimed off waivers from the the Dallas Stars and comes up to the Oilers scores right away and uh sort of becomes a, a bit of a fan favorite in oil in oil country yeah he was like for behind the scenes like he was just like a breath of fresh air and like all the misery that was going on with how yeah. poorly we were doing. So it was great. Even because we brought in Elias Bridge Galoff while I was there as well. Mm-hmm. And the when the Olympics were going on and Anton Beloff came back from Russia after they'd been eliminated, uh, they were trying to interview Beloff about his time with the Olympics and he tried to claim he couldn't understand English, <laughs> which he could because I'd had a conversation with him previously that morning. Oh. Um, but they got Bridge Galloff to try to translate for him. <laughs> and at one point, Bridge Galloff just wasn't having it. And he looked at one of the reporters and he was like, do you not understand what I'm saying? And I'm trying to film this, but I'm laughing so hard <laughs> that like my camera is like shaking. I'm like, they still need to use this footage. That's so funny. <laughs> and and on a side note it, it's pretty cool that you you see guys like uh who, players former Oilers players who've moved on into media like Gazdick and, and Ryan Whitney who still speak so well about their time with the team and are still you know loyal supporters of the Oilers I think that even shows that even though they were a part of the team during a, a very dark time in, in the franchise's history uh it's it's true about that that old saying once an Oiler always an Oiler it's very true because even like Ladislav Shemin just moved and took up residence in Edmonton as his retirement home. With his Alish Hemsky? Uh, no, Ladislav Shemin. Oh, Ladislav Shemin. Sorry, I thought. Yeah, yeah Ladislav, and he's actually uh, an assistant coach with the Edmonton Oil Kings now. Yeah, so like when I discovered he had moved here, I was like, out of anywhere in the world, you pick here because this is where you love playing. Yeah, and, and maybe they met their wife here too. You so that probably. Yeah plays a, a bit of a part in it you know if if you ha- if she has family there you know it makes it a little easier but yeah like they could have gone anywhere in north america they could have even gone back to the czech republic but um and he would be another guy just like what we talked about who really didn't get to see a lot of team success he joined the team in the fall of 2006 after they had went to the conference final of course he came over in the chris pronger trade and never played a single playoff game with the oilers but through his seven plus seasons with the team uh just showed you know how how loyal he was to this team and was a a warrior for them throughout all that time and to this day still a a big supporter of of the club so that's awesome to see that uh a lot of these guys still do that and uh were there any players on opposing teams that you had really positive interactions with uh ryan gets to the point okay. where, like, I went to the Honda Center to watch a game, and I now own a Ryan Gibbs Lab shirt. He was okay. so kind. Um, and then I got to film Timo Solani's final interview in Edmonton as well. Oh, back in 2014. Yeah, he retired yeah. that year. Mm-hmm. So that one-on-one with Jack was, like, he, like, even though, like, he's looking at the camera, he's also, like, speaking to Jack, but he also, like, speaks to the person behind the camera. So, like, He's like in the video, you could see him like looking at Jack, but also looking and like trying to like include and be like, I'm also speaking to you kind of thing. And he's just so nice. That's awesome. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, you, you never one know, you know, which players are going to be great to deal with or not. So uh, 
uh, Getzlaff uh, might not have too many fans in oil country just throughout all the battles that he had with the Oilers on the ice, but uh, glad to hear that uh, off the ice, at least uh, uh, you had a, a really positive encounter with him. Yeah, like it, it's almost like they, in some aspects they knew like I was still learning. So he'd always like even walking into the dressing room because there was times I would beat them to the dressing room. Um, he would always like say hi as he walked by and like, so he didn't like, even if they lost, he would still be like, hi, how's it going? And like, well, that's cool that they're accommodating, way. especially yeah. and, and that, you know, uh, they've done probably a thousand interviews in their career at that point. But to see someone who is still technically a student and learning the ropes to be patient with them, I, I think that also says a lot. Mm-hmm. One of Mike and not player, but coach wise, Patrick Waugh. I filmed Colorado's game or practice in Edmonton. Mm-hmm. And I, so I was standing on the Oilers bench and he literally just skated over and started talking to me, asking me like, if I was a student, what I was doing, really? what my goals were. Yeah. Just had a full blown conversation during practice about what I was doing. Wow. With one of the the <laughs> best NHL goalies of all time. Yeah. Did you ever have a moment during your, the, the time that you were working with the club and say, you know, I was this kid back in 2006 going to my first Oilers game and here I am seven, eight years later and look what I'm getting to do. Yeah, a lot. Like walking to the arena, like the day that Pittsburgh came in and like I got to see Sidney Crosby live. Like, yeah, a lot. That must have made the the late nights <laughs> uh, shooting and cutting video uh, a little a little easier uh, when you got to, you know, have those kind of cool experiences. Yeah, because like, I mean, the job was amazing and I met so many people, but at the same time, it's like, I, like I did this, like I can say that I still have my ID badge from nice. when I worked for the team. So it's like, I can say that I was employed by the Oilers. I worked for the Oilers. I met a bunch of people from the Oilers. So like, it's still in a lot of aspects surreal that I still had that part of my life. Yeah. That's so cool. And 10 years later, you speak about it so glowingly and that's something that you'll be able to show people you know 50 years from now you know that i was uh that i was with the oilers at one time i'm sure it's a a keepsake that you'll never get rid of it's very true like i still well and i was also given ryan smith's retirement video because i filmed i had the catwalk uh camera when he was doing his final laps around the ring so they gave everybody who worked that game a copy of his video i've never watched it i probably Mm -hmm. will never watch it because i will probably cry (laughs) (laughs) so but it's something to still have yeah, but it's like those things that it's like I have this from working there. Yeah, that's awesome. And what I've been most looking forward to asking you about is the time you met Wayne Gretzky. And if I remember correctly, you and Gene Principe are the only guests I've ever had on the show who have met him. I'm sure someone will message me later and say, hey, I actually met Wayne and you just didn't remember. But <laughs> off the top of my head, it's just the two of you. Uh, and I'm sure, uh, as you can guess from the name of this podcast, that Gretzky is my ultimate hockey hero. So just tell me, how big of a thrill was that for you to meet the great one? Um, I will, in fact, go on record and say this. I cried. I thought I was going to have to film the interview, and it turns out I didn't. So I got to just sit in the coach's room and watch him talk. And I just silently cried because I was in the <laughs> presence of greatness. <laughs> Yeah, I uh, I was in the same room as him once. He came to Saskatoon for a, a speaking event back in 2010. And it was him and Gordy Howe being interviewed on stage. And I mean, I was a 21-year-old kid at the time. I, I hadn't even started broadcasting school yet. I was making like, I don't know, 10 50 an hour at my job. And to save up to go to this event... It was a three hundred dollar uh, plate dinner to go to this. So, I mean, more than I'm paying for my Heritage Classic ticket. So that was a, uh, I mean, a, a lot. Three hundred dollars in twenty ten to go, but uh, that just shows how badly I wanted to just be in the presence of Gretzky, even though I knew I wasn't going to get to meet him. I, and I was probably as far away as anyone in that entire auditorium, just being at the back of it, but. Uh, just getting to listen to him talk for 90 minutes and just say that like I can see my hero across the room. It, it was all worth it. Uh, I, I'm definitely jealous, though, that, that you got to even take it a step further and meet him yourself. Oh, I got to take it a step further, actually. So yeah. I was not editing goals that night. So okay. my computer was downstairs. So post-interview, I had to go get my computer because I had to 
edit this video that we just shot. So everybody else had left me and I go grab my computer and I go to the elevator and I am waiting because I'm not climbing like eight flights of stairs and hills um, for the elevator to bring me up to the 200 so I could just climb the two flights of stairs. And who rounds the corner? But Gretzky and his security waiting to use the elevator. Wow. Yep. Must have been a starstruck so, moment for you. Yep. I was like, okay, and is this this happening? <laughs> and honest, like, super. He's such a nice guy. Like, he also asked me, like, oh, like, you're an intern. Like, what is my job? What do I do? How am I enjoying it? So the fact that he was, like, more invested in me and not me just staring at him being like, oh, my God, you're Wayne Gretzky. It was, like, you know, a really cool experience that they, like, they're willing to, like, go out and, like, talk to people still. And, like, tr- like they treat you like you're a human, too. They don't treat you like you're below them. It's so great to hear that you, when you meet these players who are superstar athletes and incredibly famous, that that they're good people as well and that they, they go out of their way to be kind. Uh, you know, I've met some other players from the Oilers dynasty, like Paul Coffey and Grant Fear. I mentioned Ryan Smith, uh, obviously from a different era of the Oilers history, but you know, one of the biggest names uh, that they've ever had as well. And just, I've come away from all of these interactions feeling really good about it. uh, And just, they treated me so well. And uh, even I ran into Darnell nurse at a blue Jays game when I was going to grad school out there and he was just waiting for his girlfriend to show up at the stadium. So he and I had about a 10 minute conversation and very much like what you said, uh, was asking me questions about myself, was interested. And, in, you know, you, you might think that, you know, these are, you know, big time athletes that wouldn't really, you know, be that interested or anything. But uh, it, it was just awesome to see, you know, how good of people these are and uh, and that that tradition throughout the Oilers has sort of been passed down from generation to generation. It's true. Like even Nuge, because I, they did Hockey Day in Canada or the like hockey day they do with kids um Mm -hmm. in bonneville which is only 25 minutes from cold lake and nuge was the oilers player that was showing up and we were just waiting for something to start so we had like a half an hour to kill together and it was like him asking me about my job what i liked about it what my dream job was like kind of thing and so like just to have like those interactions be like you're just a regular person yeah and I mean, it might not be across the board that every single person you run into is is going to treat you that well, but uh, it seems like that's the case with most of them anyway. And uh, just uh, it's great to see that so many of these players that we cheer for, idolize, or you know have watched for years, uh, turn you know live up to the expectations we have for them as people as well. It's very nice to see because honestly, I feel like if it didn't, it would probably be a little traumatizing. <laughs> Uh, and do you recall what Gretzky was in Edmonton for that time? And did you happen to get a, a picture with him? I actually still to this day have no idea why he was there. I didn't even know he was there until about 10 minutes before the interview happened. We were told that there was a first period interview happening and we had to be downstairs in the coach's room. Um, and we had to leave the catwalk at 10 minutes into the first period. And we get there and we find out that it's Gretzky's in the building. And, like he hadn't been shown on the Jumbotron or anything. Nobody knew he was there. And all of a sudden they're like, hey, yeah, so Wayne Gretzky is doing the interview. And I was like, excuse me. (laughs) Well, you know, I remember him coming to Edmonton for something that season. I I don't know because I can recall the the press conference that you you showed me a picture of. And uh, actually, this is this is funny, but uh, the documentary that they had at the time, uh, Oil Change. Mm-hmm. I, I remember the episode where Gretzky was in it and uh, he was speaking to Ryan Smith, I think either between periods or before the game, Smith was like half dressed and they were just having a conversation in the hallway outside of the locker room. Uh, and uh, yeah, I, I can recall that, but I, I just don't know specifically what he was in town for. So that's why I thought I'd ask if you, if you remembered, but um, I, I do remember that him, him talking to the media in front of the, the Oilers backdrop. Yeah. Yeah. They never did tell us why he was there. He was announced that he was in the stadium after the interview had happened and we had posted it. Yeah. But I, not a clue. And unfortunately, part of our contract did not allow us to take photos with anyone. Oh, yeah. See, yeah. that's what I kind of thought, too. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, because you are technically working, so you don't want to be like asking him. And, and he's going to get a, a ton of picture and autograph 
<laughs> request that evening <Yep. laughs> anyway. But still cool that you got to meet him and, and you know that you met him. So that's all that's that matters. <laughs> uh, and aside from meeting Gr- Wayne Gretzky, uh, what was your most memorable day interning with the Oilers and why? So it was March 30th of 2013. Um, Oilers were playing Vancouver and Taylor Hall scored a hat trick that night. I was at that game. Okay, so <laughs> that game, I at that point was watching warm up on the catwalk and then I would have to go downstairs to the Oilers room right. for the rest of the game because I didn't have a laptop at that point. Well, goal one happened while I was walking towards the oh. staircase so I could go back downstairs. Okay, sure, whatever. And he scored I, like 10 seconds into the game. Oh, yeah, it was super quick. So I stop, cheer with whoever I was around. Can't really remember that part. And then I start going down the stairs. And then all of a sudden, I can hear the crowd get loud again. And I stop on the land because there's two flights of stairs. So I stopped on the landing to lean over to see what was going on. And he scored again. And I turn around and Steve Tambellini is behind me. Also watching this happen. So then I'm now cheering with Steve Tambellini. And then all of a sudden it starts going again. So I watched those <laughs> two and three with Steve Tambellini. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, I just had, well, I mean, I, I tried to go to, even when I was in Calgary, I'd go to come up to Edmonton for one or two games a year um, during those couple of years that I was down there. And I had taken the, the bus up from uh, the ground bus from Calgary to Edmonton, met my family there. My dad and I went to the game that night and it just started off great. Like you said, right from the first whistle of the game, they, they come in. Taylor Hall picks up the puck off the faceoff, comes down on the wing, fires it over the shoulder of, I believe it was Luongo in net that night. I think Corey Schneider came in to replace him later yeah, on. But I think so, yeah. yeah, but then, of course, he ends up scoring the fastest hat trick to start a game in Oilers history. Uh, and Ladish Love Smeet, I believe, had the fourth goal that night after Hull got the hat trick. Uh, it's all in the first period and then they were done scoring for the rest of the night but cruised to victory from there and yeah it's just kind of funny how you ended up bring, bringing that one up because uh, I was in the building for that one although <laughs> I wasn't working that night. Or were you uh, with just Team Tambellini either? <laughs> no I wasn't with Tambellini either so that's that's pretty cool. Um, yeah, it's a it's a too bad about the laptop and the night getting off to kind of a rough start for you but you know, obviously the the game ended on the right note. Well, had I had my laptop, I wouldn't have had to go downstairs. Which right. Or would have happened. So. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. And uh, I know that the Oilers hosted the 1984 Stanley Cup Legacy Reunion for the 30th anniversary of their first championship team at Rexall Place in the fall of 2014. And you would have already left by then. Mm-hmm. But were there any other special events either at the arena or around Edmonton that you had the chance to cover during your two seasons with the team? So I didn't get to do anything in Edmonton. However, um, I was sent to Calgary for the prospects game that year. Oh, okay. Uh, so that was the season, season that we drafted Leon Dreisaitl. Uh So I got to do a, I got to meet him. Um, and then we got to do interviews with him. Um, and then I also, my bigger one is I got to meet Jared McCann and then I got to post a written article on Jared McCann, which then got reposted by the hockey writers. Oh, nice. So for me, I'm like, I got reposted by the hockey writers, which is really cool. And it was like one of my first articles I'd written for the Oilers. Um, I got to do, uh, almost a one-on-one interview with Aaron Eckblad. And then to make the entire day better, I got to interview Bob McKenzie. Oh, wow. Yeah, it was, I was just sitting doing my work and our camera person came in and they're like, I just got word that we have an interview with Bob McKenzie in 20 minutes. So here's Mike. We'll go over your questions as we're walking there. I was like, like Bob McKenzie for broadcasting is one of my idols. Yeah, exactly. And then, so I got to interview him and then we go up to whatever Calgary calls the catwalk and Bob McKenzie sitting next to me for the game. (laughs) And it was just how place cards worked. What do you think about walking the catwalk at the Saddle Dome? It's so scary. I did the tour one time when I was uh, still in broadcasting school there. And I'm like, there's got to be a better design for this. <laughs> You're basically so walking right over this. And I have a fear of heights. So <laughs> to to be that high and you're on this thin little walkway. Yep. And it's, it's just like, I do not trust this. 
I, it was I walked so slow. Yeah, I was just like, I mean, uh, the building is literally falling apart at this point and yeah. it should have been updated years ago, although they keep having delays for building their own new arena to try to match what we have in Edmonton, although I think that's a, it's going to be a tough one for them to top. Still <laughs> had to get that little shot in there against the Calgary, oh, but but the, the, <clears throat> but the Saddle Dome, yeah, it's a, a, of all the things that are poorly designed about it from the roof dipping in, which makes for poor acoustics to that uh, that long catwalk over the ice. I, I think they're, they're, they they could have made some better designs back in 1983. It's it's so sketchy. And even like where we were sitting, there was no railing or like blocking. Um, yeah. like plat- so the Rogers uh, Rexdale Place catwalk had like glass on our shelf where we would put our computer. There was nothing there in Calgary. If I had like pushed my laptop any further, I could have just pushed it off and like killed somebody in the yeah. seat below. Like, it was so scary. And even, like, yeah. we went post-flood, so even the ground level was just not. Yeah, I, I don't think I would want to make that walk uh, 80, or I guess 40 times a year for no, all those home games. No. And, uh, Brian, just to wrap up the show tonight, uh, I'd like to hear just a little about your expectations for the Oilers this season. You know, who are you looking for to have a big year, and do you think this team can go all the way? Well, I'm looking for a Stanley Cup. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> me too <laughs> <laughs> right but um i'm honestly like i think after watching the last two seasons i feel like they're really getting grooving with how early we did our captain skate like two weeks before everybody yeah. else this season it shows like this team is ready to go and they have like a drive to win this year um watching preseason i think and i'm hoping dylan holloway brings a lot to the team and i'm hoping mcdavid has like another hundred and <laughs> Oh, I'm hoping he goes for over 160. Yeah, you and I are on, on exactly the same page. I think uh, I don't want to give up too many of my predictions because I'm actually recording uh, the season preview show tomorrow night. But uh, I'll, I'll say that my uh, my predictions for McDavid are in line with yours. Uh, and uh, Dylan Holloway, yeah, I'd like to see him really take a big step forward this year. I think that he and Philip Broberg uh, will be counted on to elevate their game and and grow as players to help get this team to uh, the final. And like you said, showing up to have full on team skates two weeks before they're even set to begin training camp. It just shows that this team doesn't want to let the opportunity slip by to have a great start to the year. They play eight of their first 12 games against non-playoff teams. So you'd like to see them jump out to a quick start and be able to cruise to a division title the rest of the way. So, uh, yeah, I have uh, big expectations, too. And it's like we've talked about even uh, earlier in the podcast. uh, It just feels like it's been too long. 34 years is is enough. And uh, it's time to bring the cup, not just back to Edmonton, but back to Canada for the first time in three decades as well. Yeah, I'm hoping that, like, that, like, I just feel like this is our year. Like, I just, I want to have the Oilers be able to, like, Mm -hmm. and win on home ice. Yeah, I mean, I'll take a win anywhere, but yep. definitely to have that moment at Rogers Place in front of all the fans, it just, no one deserves a Stanley Cup more than Connor, and I guess Leon would be right there behind him. I mean, uh, these guys have been the driving forces offensively for the, the team for the better part of a decade now, and uh, the two greatest offensive stars in the entire league for most of that time as well. So uh, they deserve a cup. You've seen some of these great uh, duos over the years from Gretzky to Curry, uh, Lemieux and Yager, Sackick and Forsberg, Iserman Fedorov, Crosby Malkin, just all the way up. McDavid and Dreisaitl are one of the most dominant duos in NHL history, and it just seems like it's only a matter of time before they have their moment to lift the cup too. Oh, I, oh 100%. Like Even with Nuge being on his 12th. Yeah. 13th season yes yeah, 13 it's hard to believe that 2011 was co- coming up on 13 years ago yeah it makes me feel old because that's also my graduation year <laughs> <laughs> we're still young we, we got exactly <laughs> 
<laughs> That's awesome. Well, Brand, I want to say thanks so much again for being on the show tonight. It's been awesome talking to you. you. You have a background in broadcasting as well. So it's been great to hear your stories uh, about working with the team and sort of uh, the stuff that you've done even away from the rink and the fact that you're a huge Oilers fan too. So I really appreciate you taking the time. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. This was a lot of fun. And where can people follow you? Uh, you can follow me on Twitter at Brian Sackwich or uh, Instagram. Also the same handle. Okay. Everyone, please go give Brian a follow and I hope you'll come back on the show again sometime. Absolutely. Anytime. All right. So for Brianne Sakowicz, I'm Eric Friesen. This has been the 99 Forever Podcast. We're out.